In this episode, I speak to David Sobel about being a tech optimist. He talks about the need to analyse mistakes and being comfortable making predictions. I talk about the bravery required to say no to outlandish demands for exciting tech that's not really needed. Dave has been a serial entrepreneur and now helps organisations get the best out of technology. He talks about the need to show how the investment in technology can increase revenue in the business. Listen up to the rest of the conversation to learn about technology in business. The Maverick Paradox Magazine. The Maverick Paradox Magazine is for the pathologically curious. Written by a swagger of socialized mavericks who are divergent thinkers, the magazine tackles the biggest issues affecting maverick leaders today. You might be a business owner or a leader within an organization who wants to have your thinking challenged, to be exposed to a diversity of thought, or to learn from diverse experts in their fields. If so, the Maverick Paradox magazine is for you. Join the swagger at themaverickparadox.com and engage in the conversation. And today, our guest is Dave Sobel. Hi, Dave. Hi, great. Thanks for having me on. No, thanks for coming on. I know it's going to be a great podcast because you've already got me laughing already. <laughs> well, if you can't be at least amusing on this stuff, then, then there's something wrong. <laughs> so, um, amuse away. Tell us about you. Sure. So uh, I live just outside of Washington, D.C., big baseball fan, beer drinker, fun kind of stuff. But people always want to know about the professional stuff. Uh, <laughs> the So I, I graduated with a degree in computer science. And if you'd ask college Dave what he would be doing, it would be programming and developing products. And the early portion of my career was that. I was a consultant. I did some product development. You know, Now we would have called it like cloud startups kind of thing. Uh, and in 2002, when the downturn hit, uh, the lesson I learned from the startup laying off the development team was that owners and salespeople get to keep their jobs. Uh, and with, <laughs> with the brash uh, thought of a 20-something, I said, well, I'm smarter than those morons. I can run a company into the wall just as easily as they can. Uh, and I launched my first org- first company. And I, I my company was focused on helping small and mid-sized companies run their IT infrastructure and use technology effectively. Uh, ran that business for a decade, loved it, was fun, uh, bought a company during that time, which was a disaster, uh, got involved heavily in education of how to do that because I just kept wanting to learn, but ended mm-hmm. up being a trainer and wrote a book and launched peer groups and, and did that kind of stuff. Uh, and then when I had the opportunity to sell it, I took it and then went over on the vendor side. And I actually helped software to help to work on software that helped these companies do their business. And I wrote a, another startup up and we sold that one. And then I wrote a, a second one. I was in the company for about six years. Uh, we grew it. We sold it to SolarWinds, a company that people have heard of, mm-hmm. uh, mostly because of their bad news. They'd heard of them. Uh, and I stayed there through their IPO, and then I left uh, right before they got hacked. Great timing. Um, and I now do independent anal- news and analysis for that same market. So I'm now focused on the idea of helping, again, helping those companies grow, but by doing so with kind of data and news and insights on trends that they can le- then leverage in their businesses. Brilliant. Have you ever been behind the trend, i.e. you like missed, you know, you've missed observing it, missed predicting it, and then you end up trying to catch up? Yeah, I mean it. So I definitely didn't see coming the security problem. Uh, I'll uh. definitely say like I didn't didn't predict that one coming, and particularly it comes from a potentially optimistic view of of technology always that you know I'm, I'm always looking for the ways that it can help businesses not the ways that it can hurt uh so definitely the surge in cyber crime and cyber criminals mm-hmm. was something i didn't predict didn't see coming uh that that was definitely one i definitely think i didn't quite get uh, the information changes, the way we manage information and how that would change via social media. I got the power of connecting people, but, uh, but I too didn't always necessarily see the downside of that. Um, those are some of the ones that I definitely feel like I missed. Um, I've also been wrong. Um, I like on a, on a couple, I, I, I still believe it's going to happen. I just think I'm wrong on my timeline in terms of, I think voice as a user interface, I think that's a you think about your your Amazon devices or interacting with Siri or things like that. I still think that's a thing. I just think thought it was going to happen a lot faster than it was going to. So those are kind of the ones that I immediately think of that I got wrong. 
you know what? I really admire you for actually answering that question and not just picking something that everybody wouldn't have predicted so that you still look like this massive hero. I think you look more like a hero because you've been honest and pointing out the stuff that we would never know. So I like that. It's a good sense of character there. Well, th- I mean, thank you. But I also, I'll also say that I think the analysis of your mistakes is super important. Yeah. Um, I actually am I'm comfortable making predictions, but what is, imp- and, and so, I, so I, by doing so, I'm going to get a bunch wrong. If I got mm. them all right, I'm only making safe ones. <laughs> oh, I like the way you look at that. That's good. And and so, but what I also try and do is I try and ex- try and explain and talk out my reasoning on my thinking and my predictions, mm-hmm. so that other people can look at it and make their own choices based on that in my informed decision. It's okay if I'm wrong. If someone, I was laughing. If someone else goes out in the market and is more successful than me by taking the exact opposite advice to what I've given and doing something with it. I'll actually celebrate that because it's the it's the idea exploration that I think is more important to me. I don't need to be right on all the time. What I want to do is I want to be thoughtful and try and get there. And if I can make a bunch of calls that are right, that's great. But if I make a bunch of calls that are wrong and other people figure that out, that's okay too. Mm, I like that. That's good. Thank you for that. So on the basis that you are a tech optimist, how can we use tech to make our businesses grow? I like to think very strategically about this. And too many tech guys like tech for tech. And by the way, I'm guilty of that. I'm in an office full of gadgets and I'm constantly playing with things. And, and my poor mm-hmm. wife is subjected to a million crazy home automation try experiments and stuff like that. But I also then measure success based on how useful they are. Um, I'll, I'll tell the personal story and then I'll dive into how I look at it at business. You know, I actually use my wife's feedback on things that I put forth and look for those technologies that she adopts as saying like that's the successes. I'll try all these things, but if she likes one, I know I'm on to something um, because she's much more skeptical. And I think think you should take the same kind of approach. And I use actually I have a very kind of formal model for thinking about technology and business. And I call it it's very simple. I call it my good, better, best uh, model of measuring this. And I tie it very much to a business owner's profit and loss statement. Um, I think let, let's acknowledge you need technology, right? You got to have it. You got to have computers. You got to have phones. You got to have tablets. You got to have this stuff. Uh, that's good. And if you can work with a technology provider that solves that portion for you, that's good. And I mean that in the like neutral sense of the definition of the word good, right? It's, we, we also know good is delivering on the promise. Mm-hmm. That'll do, right? Delivers <laughs> a promise. So, and it's, and, and it's often viewed when technology is viewed as like an expense. And if you think about it from a profit and loss perspective, it lives down in your expense line items. Better yeah. is when I can help you with your costs of goods sold. That's still an expense, right? Costs of goods sold are still an expense, but they're directly related to how I do business. So can I use technology and can I help you be better at your costs of goods sold? Generally, that's reduction in cost, right? That's usually an area where if I can do things with technology, I can directly link the efforts that I'm doing in reducing how much it costs to run that business, make it more efficient, uh, help your people more, be more productive, but more importantly, measure it, be able to actually show the impact of the technology. And I think that's better. But what I think is best is if I can tie it to your revenue goals. If I can show that the investment in the technology drives new revenue, that's best. And I should be able to show that. I should be able to say this technology investment has resulted in you know, X pounds of turnover, right? Or X dollars of, of new new donations or X number of new customers. Like I should be able to show that and that's best. And I like to use that model to apply my technology choices. Okay. Makes a lot of sense. So how does somebody know that they're getting the right tech and they're not just getting the tech that looks really exciting? Well, you can tie it back to that. Is Can you tie it back to accomplishing those goals? 
can you directly tie it back? And a lot of techies do fall down on this. They're not great at tying it back, but the good ones are. The good ones can talk through exactly where the connection is, particularly in business, and they can tie it back to how you're going to leverage that technology in the model. And by the way, I'm not derogatory of the expense portion of it. The reason I call it good is because we know you need that. If I can help manage the expense of it and keep the business up and running, that that's good, right? It's it's accomplishing the goal. But you need to be able to tie it back to those elements in the business itself versus doing it because it's cool. <laughs> and, <laughs> and by the way, we, we know that's not always perfect, right? Anybody who's done sales and marketing, particularly marketing, knows it's never perfect. But we should definitely be able to tie things back. But mostly the exercise ensures that your tech folk understand the business needs. Yeah. Yeah, and I guess it's it's not just the tech. It's also making sure that you're able to uh, maintain it. I remember, when, I remember back in my um, corporate days, I remember working in this organization. I was... You know, head of HR, I was my senior person in HR, and looking at the organisation I was new in, and uh, the work that was delivered to the customers were done on Macs, and this was on the days where very few people used Macs because it was like a design house type thing, and all the office work was done on the PC, and the IT department only knew how to use PC, and if a Mac went down you're talking thousands of pounds a day, like of lost revenue while someone can't use the Mac. And then there was this one guy who did not sit in the IT department who was able to fix the Mac and he was paid some ridiculously high amount of money. And I remember looking at it and going, why don't we just train the IT guys to use Macs? And they were like, why would you want to do that? And I was like, because you've got one guy here getting paid like the price of three IT people. And he, whenever I see him, he doesn't really seem to be doing much because he's just waiting for a Mac to stop working. And then you've got the IT people who refuse to use a Mac and we make our money off Macs. I'm, I know I'm only HR, but that's, that doesn't seem to make good business to me. <laughs> You've completely illustrated the way there's a why there's a disconnect oftentimes between this because what you've literally described is the exact application of what I think about. Yeah. The Mac in that circumstance, the Mac generates revenue. Mm. That pieces, those pieces of technology are directly revenue generating. Yeah. They should be prioritized as such, and they should be invested as such, knowing that the create, making sure that your investment in the tech, the, the frontline creatives in that case, yeah. that's revenue driving. Why are we not measuring our IT spend on that versus back end? We can do that. We can track their time and investment. And by the way, we want to make sure that we're doing that in a way to drive revenue in the business. I can prevent that. That's definitely in my cost of goods sold, right? I can make sure that you're in, you're better. We can keep the better technology spent. And that's the way we've got to link those technology investments back to the business. You know what, you're, you're so, you're so right. But what was really funny about it was this particular organization was like uh, certainly in the top three in the country for what it did. And the client base was really like famous people. So it, it right. was a real, it was a big issue reputationally, not just the revenue, but the reputation of unable to do the thing you'd been paid to do. And I just remember going to IT and the IT guy saying, we don't like that. Right, I'm not seeing how that's relevant. <laughs> it, was, you know, it was just so funny, and like I was the only person uh, in the entire organization in years that had actually called to question why we didn't have a multifunctional IT department. And, it, and I just thought that was just it, it's one of those things that makes me laugh because quite often people say, um, that HR doesn't understand the business, they only put people orientated. But it took a HR person to look at this operation and you say, hmm, that doesn't make good operational sense. <laughs> right. You know, it's only going to cost us a few grand to send the whole entire team on a how to use a Mac course. <laughs> 
Totally. And this is oftentimes why you see, particularly for smaller organizations, they'll often work with an outsourced, you know, provider, so yeah. you know, like, a, like an IT, pro, you know, IT services company or an a managed, they often come call themselves managed services providers. There's lots of different names for this. Um, and they try and work with them because that ends up trying to disrupt that internal view of IT as mm -hmm. purely a cost center that becomes disconnected from the business. If there's an element of like of of the fact that they that is a commercial business that has to generate its own revenue, there ends up becoming some motivation to be more relevant to the business. And thus, the kind of model that I talk to is often used by outsource providers. That's oftentimes who my audience is. Uh, because that's exactly what they're thinking is how can I be more relevant to my customers? Is the, thank you. Is there a formula or or something? Because because it just makes me think about it's because it's not just small companies that have that problem, isn't it? It can be endemic in very large companies where almost the cost of tech is swallowed across a large organization. So you know, the example being you have a really senior person who's gone on a PC mag or something, seeing some super duper exciting new gadget thing that they want. And you're like, but you only do use Word. Why do you want one with all this design capabilities when the design team can't have one of these? Or, you know, it's that courage of saying, especially in the work environment, that you need to have the tech that you need to do your job, not use it as a reward because of, you know, it's not like a company car that you reach a certain level and you get a better better chair and then you get a more, you know, a computer with three screens and all you do is open Word and, and PowerPoint. <laughs> well, so I, I'll I'll say two things to that. First, I always do believe in tying the tech investment back to the to the business. Like I think there needs to be some way. But I'm also not going to be dismissive of uh, using tech using perks to drive retention and staff. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because oftentimes you know, you can look and say like, you know, if if the business looks and says in order to create the kind of business and culture we want, we're going to invest heavily in you know workstations and productivity for for users i'm oh, also no, I'm gonna all say, for, yeah i'm all for that i'm, all I'm for talking, that i'm talking about the senior people who really don't need to use that in the sense of they are you know like directors that most of the work is done by the pas and this and they li it's literally just i want something pretty on my desk as well, opposed to it's useful for my job to have up-to-date kit what I count, what I counter with personally, actually, is saying that what I would care, be careful of is is that if you're going to take that strategy, give it to everyone. Yeah like, make, yeah, like make this a tech, make make that part of the culture and make it very tech driven. Yeah. Um, I, and I, I freely admit my bias comes from small organizations, and the reason I like small organizations is they can be super agile, mm -hmm. and they can be disruptive in this way, and get and look at those kind of hierarchies and say, well, that's just silly. Right. Why would yeah, I, why yeah. would I not give amazing tech to my whole team as opposed to thinking it's something just for for senior people? And I'm going to be better at what I do because I look at it that way. Exactly. That makes a lot of sense. OK, before we end, do you have any tips on or anything that you want to say about how you can increase revenue through tech or? Um, something quite sort of tangible that might be useful, even for like a small company or a large company, it doesn't really matter. But I'm just curious if you, if you said of all the experience that you had, there's a particular way to use the tech or select the tech that would be useful. You know, it's funny because my answer is so simple. Do okay. it intentionally. Mm -hmm. it's, is that oftentimes the conversations around technology are too much limited to the expense side of the of the investment versus what it can do um particularly now 20 you know, we're, we're recording in 2022 uh it is really easy to get up and running with some really advanced technologies particularly you know cloud-based systems saas based systems and oftentimes the discussion gets very limited to, well, this is how much it costs. Mm. Whereas I really want to look at these things and say, what, what can I get 
out of that. You know, e-commerce is is ubiquitous, right? Everyone's doing it. And we can make our organizations make us drive us revenue, make us money online, even when we're not standing in the physical office or even when we're not open. And our customer base can be so much larger. It can be global. It can be, you know, cross region. It can be much greater than it's ever been before, but you have to be deliberate about it. And you've got to make sure that you're in, you're putting that in and thinking about it and then measuring those. Don't be afraid to abandon a failed experiment fast if it's not working, and that'll allow you to move on to the next one. Brilliant. I think that's been really helpful, actually. I'm sure the audience is going to get a lot out there. Thank you for coming on the show, Dave. Well, thanks for having me. This has been this has been a fun discussion. Yeah, it has. And thank you out there for tuning into the Maverick Paradox podcast. I hope you have enjoyed listening to my conversation with Dave as much as I enjoyed The Maverick Paradox. Judith Germain is an author, speaker, consultant, mentor and trainer, and the leading authority on Maverick leadership. She is the founder of the Maverick Paradox, which supports organizations to enhance their leadership capabilities and to help business owners develop and grow their businesses. Judith enables individuals, business owners and organizations to improve their impact and influence. She is also HR Zone's leadership columnist, an international online radio host, and her expert opinion has appeared in national, international, and trade press.